it's actually pretty easy, as you can see, you know, to start you know, the recording. Um, the software is easy to set up, at least in Linux. Um, this is a USB microphone. I think the quality is not bad. I mean, if you have checked out the video, the, the, record, the audio quality is not bad. And also, the resolution of the video can actually be bumped all the way up to 720p. So in which case, you should be able to see everything that I do on the, uh, on the whiteboard. Very good. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Last time we <coughs> talked about assignment, um, the assignment operation, where you have, I'm just gonna draw this on the whiteboard for now. You have a right hand, a left hand side, and then you have the left arrow, and then you have the right hand side. This is called the assignment operator. You know, this is the assignment operator, the left arrow itself. The operation is to evaluate the right hand side. Whatever the right hand side becomes, you will use it to update the left hand side. That's the assignment operation. We talked about that on last Thursday. And some of you probably have read ahead of me and find out what else you know, we'll talk about today. The first thing we'll talk about is a new homework assignment. Some people will say the preview the previous one is not even due yet. And we're now getting a new homework assignment. And that is right. That is actually fairly typical of this class you may have one or two active homework assignments at any particular time. The previous homework assignment is really easy. I mean, the one that is actually still active to get to get the LibreOffice. You know, the whole thing is just to, to get LibreOffice installed, um, configure it so that it has your name on it, download the document from the homework assignment, um, fill in the blanks, save it, and then upload it back to Moodle again. Okay, there's no, there's nothing specific to programming or algorithm. I just want to make sure everybody has OpenOffice or LibreOffice set up in this particular homework assignment. There's a second homework assignment here. Okay, now these other two are for my other classes because in Moodle you can actually see all the homework assignments and assessments that are pending um, on the front page right after you log in. When I go to this particular class, then I can see you know, just the um, events for this particular class. Are there any questions about the first homework, homework assignment, Get LibreOffice, which is due on Thursday, right before the class? No questions? Okay. 36 people have turned it in already. I have 44 who are currently on system, not counting the people who are still on wait list. So we are still missing eight uh, submissions. So those eight people should get on it as quickly as possible. Many times I would do something like this. I'll give you a homework assignment. I'll let you take a look at the homework assignment first before we actually talk about the topic. So that way, you know, hopefully, you know, people would pay more <coughs> attention, you know, because, you know, okay, so I'm going to talk about will be directly related to the homework assignment. So let's go ahead and take a look, take a peek at this new homework assignment. This is a very general format of the homework assignments. Um, you have to download a file, which you will have to open using OpenOffice. And inside the document, there will be two sheets, you know, two tabs at the bottom. The first one, sheet one, is going to be the algorithm. In other words, that's the code that you have to trace. And then the second one in sheet two, sometimes it's blank, sometimes it is pre-formatted. It is whatever you have to do as your homework assignment. So we'll take a look at this file, right click, and then save the link as you know, a particular file. Remember where you put it. And um, let's see what I will do today. I am going to make a folder for today. So this way I can upload the files that I work on today onto the Moodle website. And I'll do the same thing here. I will save this document here. I'm not going to work on it. I'll just you know, save the file over there. And then you can go to Open Office. You know, it's about the same thing in Windows. You just have to go to a slightly different place to open up Open Office or LibreOffice Calc. <coughs> and open the document. Remember where you saved it to begin with? So go to the place where we saved the document and then open it. in a little bit. This is the algorithm. This is your homework assignment. This is the code that you have to trace. 
So we'll talk about you know something similar to this, but not exactly the same. In other words, I will do not exactly your homework assignment, but I will give myself something to do in this class that illustrates how do how are we going to finish an assignment like that. In sheet two, which is here, this is where you have to type something, you know, as the answer to that question. Right? Any questions about the general format of doing your homework assignment? Yes, sir. So the question is sheet one, you want the answers on sheet two? Yes, I want sheet one to be the question. That's the algorithm. And then the, the, the trace or your part will be on sheet two. I'll teach you a way to do it very easily so you don't have to flip flop between the two sheets. So that's your homework assignment. When you're all done, remember to save the file first before you upload it. Because before you save the file, it is still the original file. And you upload it back to Moodle, and I open it, it was like, well, you know, there's nothing done here. So remember, remember to save the file first before you upload it to Moodle. All right. So let's get back to here and start with um, the topic that we were in on the other day. We were pretty much done with uh, sections one, two, three, four, and we were just you know starting on five. Instead of reading my notes on section five, what I'm going to do is to give myself something similar to your homework assignment, um, and then I'll go through that, explain all the steps that are necessary and why those steps are necessary. From now on, you will see that I use OpenOffice Calc a lot because every time I want to explain how an algorithm works, I will give you a trace. In other words, um, it's a line by line tracking of what is happening in the in the program. All right, so I'm gonna give myself an, assi uh, an assignment right now on the fly. So I'll say I guess a value of six. Um, I guess, you know, I divided by two, J, well, let's pick another K, because J and I are pretty much, you know, they look very similar on the screen, so I'm going to pick another letter K. K gets the value of I times 2, and then K gets a value of 2, and that's it, okay? Um, does it look similar enough to your homework assignment? Yeah. It has about the same kind of operators and, um, you know, nothing really exotic here. The only thing that might uh, trouble some people is, you know, division is not, you know, the, the traditional division symbol, which is a dot, a bar, and a dot. It is a slash symbol. Um, when you do programming, um, that is basically all programming languages would use is a forward slash symbol to represent division. Same thing for multiplication. This is normally called the asterisk symbol, but in, in programming, it is the multiplication operator it replaces the typical multiplication cross that we usually use in math classes. <coughs> Are there any questions about what I have here? Okay. Every time I give you an algorithm, I will also give you the line numbers. I know the row numbers are already one, two, three, four here, but I want to give you, you know, the, uh, the line number nonetheless. <coughs> Now the reason why I need line numbers is because when I trace the algorithm, I want to know what is the result of executing a single line in the algorithm. We're going to do that step by step, very slowly, and that's basically all we are doing in this semester. The entire semester will be doing traces, not programs like this simple. You know, eventually we'll have very you know, fairly complicated algorithms to trace, but nonetheless we have the same mechanism to show us or to let us know what the program is actually doing step by step, line by line. All right, so let me save the file first before I forget. I will save this file as example one. Okay. Now, here comes the um, not so tricky part, you know, but it's convenient to know how to do this. Go to Window in OpenOffice or LibreOffice and say New Window. What it does is it opens up two windows, in this case, from the same document. If I change one, the other one will update automatically. But the best thing this will give me, the best ability is I can now do this. In other words, I can have one window to stay on sheet one, 
and I have another one to stay on sheet two. So now I don't have to go back and forth, you know, flip-flopping all the time. I can have one to display just the algorithm, and then the other one, so I can trace it. Any questions about what I just did on the whiteboard? Yep. Probably stated the obvious, but wouldn't it just be easier if we just use column C and have the answer there? That would be easier for our first homework assignments, you know, but later on the trace will be so long that it will be scrolling off. So this is actually far more convenient when the algorithm itself is short, but the trace is much longer. Okay? But just so that we know, you know, we have a good habit, you know, this is what I want everybody to do, even for simple homework assignments like what we are doing now. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. The first column, I would label that as line number, and you should do the same in your homework assignment. The line number column is basically just, excuse me, just to indicate, um, okay, let me first describe, you know, what the rows are. Column B and column C will represent the history of how each variable changes. So one will be labeled for as I, because that's the name of the variable here. And the other one is labeled as K, which is our other, our other variable in the algorithm. So if you look at it, one column is the history, historical record of how the value of one variable changes over time. If you look at it from a row perspective, each row is a slice of time. In other words, I want to see at the end of a particular line number, what was the value of i and k at that time. So a slice of time is a row. The historical record of a variable is a column. Okay. So let's go. I have a quick question. Yep, go ahead. On our homework assignment, mm -hmm. should we assume that that x and y equals zero to begin with? No, that is a good question, but the answer is no, we do not assume they are zero, then which is, it's, I'm just getting there. Oh, okay, just hold on one second. Very good, good question. The first line is labeled pre. Pre stands for precondition. In other words, what do we know about these variables before the first, first line of the algorithm? Okay, so that basically, you know, is what you're asking is, what do we know about these variables? Different programming languages have different default values. If you look into Visual Basic and most scripting uh, programming languages like Pro and uh, PHP, you can kind of say that I and J, you know, had a value of zero when they first get created. But that is not the case in C programming. When you program in <coughs> C, when a variable you know, starts to exist, it comes with an unknown value. It has a value, you just don't know what it is. And in this class, we use question marks to represent the value of a variable is unknown. Now this is a very important part when you write programs, particularly in C, Java, and any programming languages that do not initialize variables to begin with. Because if you make assumptions about variables when they first exist, and you do not initialize it explicitly, and the programming language turns out not to guarantee that particular value, your program will work sometimes, or even most of the time. But sometimes it won't work, because the value that is in the question mark turns out not to be what you assume it to be. So this is very important. I know it sounds like a very trivial thing, but it really has significance in this class because most of you are going to CISP 360. All right, so after the precondition, we will start with line one. After line one, what is the value of I? Six, very good, because well, it's an assignment, sorry? We don't know if what it was beforehand, so we can't see it was six. Well, we know what it is after line one executes. Oh, okay, gotcha. So in other words, each row represents the value of each variable after that line executes. Not before, but after. Okay? So we know that I, for sure, is going to have a value of six because the assignment clearly, the assignment operation clearly states that the right-hand side is a constant of six. And the left-hand side is the variable I, and therefore variable I is updated to a value of 6. Are we doing okay so far with i? What about k? 
It's still unknown. It's still question mark because you know the assignment operation does not affect it. It was unknown before, it is still unknown. Let's take a look at line two. After line two, what is the value of i? It's going to be 3 because the right hand side is i divided by 2. i had a value of 6. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So the right hand side evaluates to 3. We use that value to update the left hand side. The left hand side so happens to be i again, and therefore i is updated to a value of 3 after line 2 is done. Any questions about this? Okay. What about k? It is still unknown, so we still put a question mark here. Let's take a look at line 3. What is the value of i after line 3? Three? 3 because line 3 does not even affect i. So it gets to keep its you know, old value, which is 3. What about k? Well, k becomes 6 because i has a value of 3. How do we know that? We know it because of row 4. Because i has a value of 3, 3 times 2 is 6. And the value 6 is used to update the variable k. And therefore, k ends up with a value of 6. Very good. Let's go to line 4. What about line 4? After line 4, what is the value of i? 3. 3, because it does not even touch that variable. How about k? 2. 2. Very good. It's just that. The, the 6 is gone completely. Okay. Whenever you update a variable, its old value just it disappears. There's no way to retrieve the value of a variable once you overwrite it with another value. Are there any questions at this point? Yep. If you click on window one, will you see that thing on the left? The, the part that's on the, that's actually on the left? If I... Like the, the, the window that you're on right now, if you click sheet one right there at the bottom, mm -hmm. we'll show you the parts. Yeah, okay, that's what I was curious. All right. yeah. Yeah, it's just another view of the document, but a document can have multiple sheets. All right, <coughs> well, we're almost done. That's, that's just one more step here. At the end of a trace, you have to say post on the line number column. This tells me that this is the end of it. You're done. It's the same as um, you know putting a square at the end of a mathematical proof or QED or something along that line. It is a clear indication that this algorithm is completed. Post, by the way, stands for post condition. Okay, which means it, what is the condition after the algorithm executes? In this case, the post condition is i equals three and k equals two. Are there any questions about this? No uh, questions. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how, uh, how do you get the less than um, and dash to uh, equal the the left arrow? On mine, it's not switching to the left. <laughs> well, that's a top secret Auto thing. I was looking <laughs> at options, but I couldn't find it. You have to go to tools and then go to autocorrect options. And if, that, if it doesn't have you know, the map to it, you can add one to it. Now, in this class, you, you guys don't have to write your own algorithm. So you know, for your own purposes, like when you're writing your own notes, maybe it's helpful. But for the most part, you just have to trace an algorithm that I give you. OK? Um, I can show you exactly how it is done. Okay, let me go ahead and remove um, that particular you know, mapping. Okay, so if you want to mess around with an uh, open office, so that you can have your know, uh, when you type less than and dash, it will give you the proper left arrow symbol. This is how you do it. You go to um, insert, and then go to special character, and then from the special character, you can kind of look through this stuff here to find the left arrow. It'll be right there. That's the left arrow. And we'll just go ahead and insert it once into one of these cells. Okay. The next thing you want to do is to um, okay. highlight it. And then you go to Tools. You go to Auto Correct Options. And then you go to Replace here. Now, it automatically puts the symbol or whatever symbols that you have um, into the width portion. In other words, all you have to do is to now to say, if open office sees a less than symbol followed by a minus symbol, replace it with the actual left arrow symbol. So this way you can actually make it you know, map 
you know, a lot of the common sequences into symbols that are hard to, difficult to type in, you know, n normally. Okay. Yep. Is the one dash different from two dash? Um, one dash is the same as two dash. The two dash is already built in. I just you know, don't want to have to type two dashes. <laughs> Any questions about this step? Yep. Do you don't want us to put the variable values in the post condition line then? There's no need to do it okay. because uh, the post condition simply means you know this is the end of the trace. For simple algorithms like this, it seems to be senseless. Okay, the program only has four lines, so why do we have to say this is the end of the trace? But later on, we'll have algorithms that will take that, that has loops. You know, it will do the same thing over and over again. So it becomes more difficult to tell whether you're actually done with tracing the algorithm or you have just taken a break <laughs> and decided, oh, okay, I'll come back later. Okay, so that, that's why we have a post here. Okay, any questions? Now these are the conventions that you have to follow with the new homework assignment. Okay, I want columns to be labeled similarly. Okay, you have different variables, so obviously i and k will be your x and y. Um, you still need a line number. You still need one one row for the pre and one row for the post. Okay. Are there any other questions about this particular homework? Yep. Does it matter what order we put the variables in the top? It does not matter. In other words, if you prefer your K first and I, that's fine, as long as they're consistent. So within the column, it has to be the same variable. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions? Okay, very good. How long would this take you? Yes, your homework assignment. Five minutes. <laughs> It might take you a few more, you know, because you know, if for people who are not familiar <coughs> with Open Office Calc, you know, it may take you a few more, you know, minutes just to get used to the tool. But once you get used to the tool, you know, this is a really simple one. All right. So I'll save this one. You know, this will be uploaded um, to Moodle so that you guys can download the file. If I forget to upload it, and I did upload, you know, YouTube, you can actually watch the YouTube and actually get the whole content anyway. So. There's a little bit of redundancy here. And that's basically what this is all about. Okay? It's the same stuff, except I did a live demonstration of what is already discussed in topic five of this particular module. Yep? Uh, can you put the, put the link for your YouTube site? Because I was looking at YouTube. Here. There's no need to do that, because you just search for it. <coughs> the best way to do it is to go to YouTube and type you know, some profs. And then you can, um, basically what you do is to, oh, where's my channel? Right here. So click on the channel. And then go to videos, I think there's a link for videos somewhere. Yeah, I have to click on Oh, I have to click on it again. Okay, so that's so. Once you click on it, you can click on you know video, which will list all the videos, um, last one first. Okay, and I also you know make sure that the file name or the video title is based on the date, and also the course code, which is CISP three hundred for this class. So between those two, you know, going to my channel and using the date of the lecture, you should be able to locate um, the video recording of that particular day. Um, obviously, you guys can also take uh, CISP 370, 310, 453, you know, you know, through YouTube. You won't get any credit, but the class recording is there. <laughs> I actually had one student who was taking CISP 300, this class, and he found out about my recording for CISP 310, and he was able to get about one half through the semester before he threw his hand and go, wow, this is way too much for me. But he was following the lecture, you know, on YouTube, you know, halfway, at least halfway through the semester. And now he's taking that class, so the first half of the class is going to be super boring to him because it's the same stuff. I've heard that joke again. <laughs> <you know. coughs> but this is, I think it is kind of nice, you know, because you can actually pre-take a class like this. Or if you want to, you can review a particular class in this class. Yeah, I'm teaching it this semester. 
I'm teaching this class 310 and 453 this semester. Now those two classes are fairly advanced. I mean you have to have CISP 360 before both of those classes. So right after this class you take 360? Sorry? After this class you take 360? Correct. After this class you can take 360. Um, there are other options too, but most of you are going to take CISP 360 because that's what your degree requires. Any questions? No questions? All right. So we are done with um, this particular part, and now we are moving on <coughs> to conditional statements. So things will get a little bit more interesting now with conditional statements. Well, let's go through the why first. Okay. At this point, what, what kind of capability do we have you know, writing algorithms? We actually have sequences, right? What is a sequence? A sequence is operating or executing the assignment statements one by one in sequence. Line one goes first, line two goes second, line three goes third, and so on. It's a sequence, which means you have to perform those operations step by step, having one follow the other one. Okay? We also have the ability to do assignment operations. In other words, we can have assignments that, assignment operations that look like this. There's a right-hand side, it can be any expression, it can be very long, it can be very short, it can be just a constant, it doesn't matter. Whatever value the right-hand side eva evaluates to, we use that to update the left-hand side. So we have a mechanism to change the value of variables. And then later on, other assignment operations can refer to the value of these variables that have been changed by a previous assignment operation, just like your homework assignment. Um, well, you can get so many things done. You can get a lot of computations done using just sequences and assignment operations, but not much more than that. Okay? So if your computer can only do these, you know, can, can only perform sequences and also assignment operations, we won't have you know, interesting programs like a browser or an operating system or anything like that because it doesn't have the ability to make decisions. So we want the computer or a program to have the ability to go, oh, sometimes I want to go this way and perform those operations, and other times I want to go the other way and perform those operations. And that's why we need a, a conditional statements. Okay, now let's talk about conditions. This slide, you know, I have, you know, I usually don't emphasize too much on this slide because uh, it really is just to state, you know, natural languages are inherently somewhat ambiguous. Let me go outside and get it. Somebody's <laughs> out. <laughs> Some guys is recording this, so. You get him? Good job, good job. Well, they're just politely asking to, you know, lower their volume. Probably. They were politely. Yes. I actually have a uh, pepper spray in my uh, fanny pack, but. You get out there and be like, I'm going to pepper, pepper spray you, boy. Just like the UC, the Davis police. <laughs> <laughs> Do it. Those, nice. those students were you know, sitting on the, on the ground already doing nothing, and the guy just called. You know, it was just a shh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the YouTube video where they spliced all the videos together to show what actually happened? No. There's a like there's like a 30 minute long video on there that shows like what actually happened there, and the, the processors were trying to were, had the police entrapped yeah. mm -hmm. and trying to get them to release the other students that were already arrested. Oh. So they were trapping the police there so they couldn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they got pepper sprayed. Yeah, but at that time, you know, it, I think it was just a uh, you know. <laughs> They could have handled it differently. I, I think they, they, they could still ha have handled it differently. The police. I mean, if they had done, if, if they were to do this, you know, in some other parts of the country, it probably would just be like, oh yeah, that's the right way to do it, you know. But in Davis, it's just the wrong place to do it. I mean, that's just the wrong place to do this sort of thing. I mean, uh, yeah. 
So anyway, um, this slide is about the ambiguity of natural languages because in some languages, you know, the answer can be different depending on how you ask the question. Okay. So in computer science or when you write um, algorithms, we want everything to be clear, crystal clear, and very precise. So we don't use yes and no as answers to questions. We use true and false. Is it true or is it false that x is greater than y? It's very clear. Is it true or is it false that x is not greater than y? Also very clear. It is true that x is not greater than y, or it is false that x is not greater than y. <coughs> okay, so that's the basically what this slide is about. Next, we talk about the conditional statement thing. So right here, let's not even look at the code. Okay, what this problem is, is I have two variables. I want to find the maximum or the larger one of the two variables. How do we do it? How do we find the larger value of two variables? Well, that's kind of you know difficult without conditional statements because sometimes x is the one that is greater and other times y is the one that is greater. Sometimes they're the same, which means you can pick either one. But I want z to store the maximum of those two. Okay. This is the code to do it. And this is a little picture of a conditional statement. And particularly, this is a picture of that particular conditional statement. So let me move the mouse pointer away because it is pointing in the wrong direction. When I draw a picture like this to represent the logic of a program, you always come in from the north. Okay, so you're always coming down from the north to begin with. And here we have a branch. A branch means you can choose one way or the other. You cannot go in both directions. Okay? When we write a program, or when the program executes, you can only at one place at any particular time. So if you were here at the top, then after this step, you can only be here or here. You cannot be at both places at the same time. What does that mean? Doesn't that mean that you have to choose which way to go? So when you have to choose which way to go, then you have to answer the question. Look at this one here. Look at this, you know, x is greater than y in a box right here. That is not a statement. It is not saying that x is greater than y. It's actually more of a question. Is it true or is it false that x is greater than y? That's what that box is about. It's a question. Now, when you answer that question, you can only have one or this, you can only have one or the other answer, which is true or false. And that's why the two paths leading away from the branch, one is labeled true and the other one is labeled <coughs> false, so that depending on the answer to the question, now you can decide which way to go. If it is true, you go to this way here, and then Z will get the value of X. If it is false, you go, to the, you go through this branch here, and then Z will get the value of Y. But regardless of which way you go, eventually those two paths will join again before you exit. After you get out from this code, the next one to the south of this thing can be any other statement. It can be another conditional statement, can be an assignment statement, can be anything. Yes? You said if we don't initialize, we can't make assumptions on numbers? So correction. That is correct. I can't help but wonder. Why can't x equal y if they're the same value? It can. I mean, if x equals y, then you have to follow the path of false. Because x equals y means that x is greater than y is false. OK? Now, this one does not say you know, what is the value of x or what is the value of y. This picture only illustrates the logic of just this block of code. There has to be some other code in front of it or about it that will determine, that will give you the value of y, x and the value of y before you can make a decision because otherwise you cannot compare an unknown to an unknown. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? Nope. All right. Well, let's go ahead and trace it. I'm going to write you know, something that is you know, very similar to that picture. In fact, you know, it's the same. So x is 5, y is 10. Okay? And then if x is greater than y, 
then z gets the value of <coughs> x, else z gets the value of y, and if, hmm, this looks different from the code that we have earlier on the whiteboard, I mean uh, the projector. How is it different? The spacing seems to be a little off, right? If you compare this code, or compare that to what we had earlier here, other than the very simple thing like the parentheses and the font size and stuff like that, don't you notice that on line two here, there's a little bit of space um, on the left hand side, but here we don't? It's called indentation, okay? That is indentation, and it is very important that we use the right indentation, especially in this class. But in every single class in programming, you should observe the rules of indentation. I'll explain why indentations are useful later, but for now, we'll just say that, well, it's kind of important. And I will give you give these lines line numbers so that we can refer to the line numbers. If you want to make each column only as wide as it requires, here's a quick trick. Click on the column, and then you can do a shift, and then click on the column. So this will select all the columns in between if there are any columns in between. And then go to the border of the last column until the, uh, the mouse pointer becomes like this double-sided arrow. Double click, <coughs> and it will, automa it will automatically resize the <coughs> column to exactly the width that it needs to be. It just makes it easier to look at, you know, it just makes more better use of the space on the screen. Open a new window for the trace. <coughs> Same thing, we have line number. Now this time we have another column called comments. The comments column is needed here because I want you to explain to me why you decide to go one way or the other way. So I want you to tell me what is the result of the condition when you encounter a conditional statement. That's why we have comments here. I'll show you exactly how to use that column here. We still have line number, and this time we have three variables, x, y, and z. Now you can tell me that x and y, you know, once they have their initial value, they don't change the value. That is absolutely true, but they are still variables, so we still have to have columns to represent those variables. Alright, so let's go ahead and get started. The precondition, unless I tell you something about a precondition, you always have to make the assumption that the variables start with unknown values. It is the safest assumption. Are there any questions at this point? No questions, we'll move on to line one. After line one, what is the value of x? Five, okay, very good. What is the value of y? It's still unknown, right? We haven't really done anything to y. And the same applies to z. We still haven't done anything to z. Now, from now on, I'm going to be lazy, OK? If there's no change to, a va to the value of a variable, I simply do, I just leave it blank. So in this case, I'm going to leave um, y and z blank because the value has not changed. Because otherwise, it gets really tedious really soon, re real fast because, you know, we will have a lot more lines to trace and more variables to track too. So this way, it is just a easy, it, it's just much easier to keep track of stuff. Okay, line two. After line two, what is the value of x? It doesn't do anything to x. So I'm going to leave it blank, which means it is implied that it keeps its value from the previous line. Is that okay? So the convention is, if you don't want to type you know, five and question mark all over the place, you leave a cell blank to mean it has not changed, will keep the same value from the, the row before this row. Yes? So it's okay if we do that on our own? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now, how, how about y? What is the value of y after line two? 10. 10. Okay, very good. And we haven't done anything to z, so this will be left blank because we have not changed the value of z, which is the same as the row before, which is the same as the row before, which is unknown. Are we doing okay so far? Up to this point, they're all assignment statements, stuff that we should know already. On line three, we are doing something that we have not done before. This is the entry point to a conditional statement. In other words, the first thing you have to do is to evaluate 
the stuff inside the parentheses, the condition of the conditional variable, uh, of the conditional statement. X is greater than Y. Is it true or is it false? It is false. Okay, very good. So in the comments portion, this is where you have to write X is greater than Y is false. Don't spell out false because you will just take up more space. You know, using F to represent false is fine. But you do have to indicate the result of the condition. <coughs> so there's nothing else. Am I going to change any variables on line three? No. The line does not change anything in terms of the value of variables. But it does change one thing. It changes the flow of the algorithm. In other words, depending on the condition, Sometimes we proceed onto line four, other times we proceed onto line six. What do you think we should do in this particular case? We proceed to line six. Why are we proceeding to line six? According to this picture, okay, according to this picture, if the condition, whatever it is, if it is false, you have to proceed to whatever is after the else word. Is that okay? Let's go back and look at both screens at the same time. So the next line is going to be line six. Now, it is not line five, because line five is what I would call as a marker. It's strictly, you know, it's only there to separate the then portion from the else <coughs> portion. In other words, line five has no meaning when you're actually running the program. It does not do anything. And that's why I don't track line five. If you accidentally track line five for the next homework assignment, it's okay. But you know, later on in the semester, I do not want you to track these marker lines. Okay, so what do we do on line six? Do we make any changes to x on line six? Do we make any changes to y on line six? Do we make any changes to z? Z becomes 10, very good. And we don't track line seven either. Okay, line seven is there only because I want to indicate the end of the conditional statement. So that's why we don't track it. That means if we are done with the algorithm at this point, post. Yep. If it had been true, would we still be able to skip line five? That is correct. Another question? Question? Okay. That's a very good question. So let's go ahead and use another example to illustrate that. So we'll save this file first. I'll say you know, this is else because you know, we're going to the else case. I just have to change the algorithm very slightly to go to the then case. So we resave the file as then. And I'll, I'll go ahead and erase all this stuff here and then just you know, start from scratch because you know it's good exercise also. Um, let's make x um, 12. Okay? That will change the flow of the program. All right. Precondition, same thing, everything is unknown to begin with. Then we go to line two. Line two <coughs> this time changes x in a different way. Oops, sorry, line one. Line one this time changes x to 12 instead of um, five. Line two still changes y to 10. And then line three still evaluates whether x is greater than y, but the answer is different this time. It is true that x is greater than y. Are there any questions up to this point? So in this case, we do not go to line six anymore. We only go to line four, okay? And line four is not gonna change x or y, but it does change z. Z gets the value of x, so it becomes 12, and then we are done, post. Now why are we skipping line six? Well, we're skipping line six because in the picture, if you look at this picture here, if we take either branch, okay, after you perform whatever is in that branch, you still have to get out automatically. You do not go through the other branch after you take one branch. Are there any questions about you know, the picture and how the execution of the algorithm matches the logic that is displayed by the picture? No questions? Now the first time, yes, go ahead. Actually, um, so on line three, when you're saying whether the condition was true or false, are you writing the value of z here, or are you still putting it? Okay, let 
me on line three when we are answering the question of whether the value of z is not used in the process. Okay, so you don't write any values in? Sorry? So you don't write any values in, you just... Because nothing has changed on that line. Line three is only reading the value of <coughs> the variables, but it's not changing them. So that's why there's nothing on the, on the right-hand side. And that's why it's also important to make sure you write down on the, in the comments column about the result of the condition. So I think we got the basics of conditional statements and conditions. Let's move on and talk about the next slide. Um, now we become a little bit more, um, look, okay, I think I skipped something, didn't I? I, I skipped comparisons. This slide should be fairly simple. Um, basically all I'm doing is to show you all the comparison operators that we should know already that we already should know at this point. Is any one of these comparison operators foreign to you or require explanations? Okay, we have greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, not equal to, and equal to. So that part is pretty easy. I mean, this is stuff that you learn in what, third or fourth grade or something like that, okay? What is something that you might want to read and kind of, you know, uh, understand is how do we use this in a program? I mean, this is a symbol that I can enter in HTML and also in OpenOffice, but when you're writing a program using a text editor, your keyboard doesn't have a symbol for greater than or equal to. When you write a program, this is all you have to do to represent greater than or equal to. It is a greater than symbol followed immediately by an equal symbol. This is almost universal to all programming languages, except for a few, okay? Um, same thing for less than or equal to. You can write it as less than followed by an equal symbol, and it's almost universal as well. Now, not equal to is a little bit different. <clears throat> when you're programming in C and C++, you use exclamation point followed immediately by equal symbol to represent not equal to. In other programming languages, they typically use this symbol to represent not equal to because when if x is less than or greater than y, it is the same as saying x is different from y or x does not equal to y. And therefore, they use the symbol less than greater than to represent not equal to. Is that okay? All right. And how about equal to? Equal to is represented by double equal in C and C++, and this is particularly important to you because you, most of you are moving on to CISP 360. It is very important to differentiate single equal in C, which means assignment, and double equal in C, which means comparison, to check whether equality is there or not. Okay, so this is very important when you're programming in C and C++ and any language that is derived from C and C++. In other programming languages, such as Visual Basic, SQL, Pascal, and so on, it is represented by a single equal symbol. Any questions at this point? No questions? All right. So now we will move on to, just talked about this. <coughs> I guess we have to go up first. And then we can talk about logical operators. Now the, way, the reason why we have to talk about logical operators is what if I want to extend my algorithm to find the maximum of, instead of two variables, we want to find the maximum of three variables. How are we going to do that? Well, I kind of know that we can use this kind of framework you know, to do it. Um, in listing two, this is a framework that I can use to find the maximum of three variables. C1, C subscript one is a condition that will be true if and only if W is the largest of the three. Okay, I don't quite know how to express it yet, but we'll figure, it, we'll figure that out. Now, if C1 is not true, in other words, if W is not the maximum, then maybe X is. Well, C2 is a condition that will be true if and only if x is the maximum of the three. Okay? 
What if C1 is false and W is not the maximum? C2 is false and X is not the maximum? Well, because I only have three variables, the third one has to be the maximum. And that's why, in this case, I can just say, oh, Y must be the maximum, you know, because W and X are both not the maximum of the three. So the big question, well, there are two questions. One question is, well, I don't really quite understand what is this else if business. That's the first one. And the second one is, what do I put here, C1 and C2? <clears throat> In other words, let's look at C1 first. How can I confirm that W is the maximum of W, X, and Y? Now, one comparison can only be used to compare two values. In other words, I can say W is greater than X. I can confirm whether it is true or false that W is greater than X. I can also use another comparison to, com to confirm that W is greater than Y. But I cannot use a single comparison to confirm that W is greater than or equal to both X and Y. So what do I need now? I need something to put those put to put two conditions together to become one bigger condition. So what we need is called a logical operator. Okay. And that's the next slide. Now logical operators are really just you know fancy <coughs> names for stuff that we have already used in daily languages. It, it, this is regardless of you know what language you speak. It, it's in English, it's in Chinese, it's in Japanese. Any spoken language have these particular components. And obviously, conjunction is yet another fancy word for and. Okay, the English word and a and d is called conjunction in mathematics. When do you use the word and? All the time. Hmm? All the time. All the time. Whenever, whenever you're comparing two things, or well, in, in language you're using it whenever you're adding two things together. Okay, so you need. Okay. So it's, it's kind of like a linking thing to link two things together. Now how does that, how is and different from or? Because or in English is also a word that you use to kind of link the different things together. Go ahead. And combines two statements in one comparison. Say again? So and would combine two statements together or four would I think I got your concept, okay? The concept is when you use the word and, it means all of those things have to be all true for the statement itself to be true. Okay? When you use the word or, the statement is true if at least one of the items is true. Okay? Um, for instance, what do you think of the statement? Is it true or is it false that tag is, oh, I don't know. Tag is tall and he knows programming. That would be false, right? Because I'm not tall. So the entire statement, so even the one component of the statement is true, the entire statement is false because at least one of the items is false. What if I say, you know, tag knows programming and just trying, and he, al he always wears shorts. That would be a true statement because I, I always wear shorts, even in, you know, low 30s and high 20s. And I do no programming. So when, when all of the components in a conjunction are all true, only at that time the conjunction itself is true. Is that okay? And now that is really fuzzy, okay? The way I explained it is, you know, is very fuzzy. It's a much better way to represent it like this, but let's go ahead and read the rest of this. <coughs> in English, a conjunction is and. That's actually another word that we use as a conjunction, but most people do not associate it as a conjunction. What is the word that also means and, but we don't really usually use it as the and word? Also, also, also is a common word, you know, but that's a good that's a good one. Um, as well as it also also means and, but that's one that has um, it implies contrasting properties, but it really is used as the word and is is actually a conjunction. But, yeah. exactly, um, this reminds me of the commercial, uh, there's a beer commercial, do you guys still remember? Rich but not smooth, no? <laughs> I guess I watch more TV than you guys, 
that's <laughs> not <laughs> that is that. Okay, but there's a commercial called um, I cannot even remember what the beer was, um, but there's a commercial and then they show a guy, you know, who is rich but not smooth. <coughs> okay, okay. So let's look at that you know sentence here. Someone who is rich but not smooth means that both of those things are true. Okay, that guy is wealthy, has a lot of money, drives a, a Lamborghini, but not smooth. <laughs> okay, so the word but in English actually means conjunction, but it also adds a property, it also adds an attribute of contrasting properties. Because rich, you know, to most people is a good quality, but not smooth is not a good quality. So even though both are true, they have a contrasting or opposite pole to those particular, I guess, you know, descriptions. All right. In mathematics, and sometimes I use this symbol in the in this class too. Um, a little TP is you know conjunction. It means and in mathematics. When you write this in C and C plus plus, the conjunction operator is known as the double ampersand. Now, what if you use a single ampersand instead of double ampersand in C and C plus plus programming? It's not a syntax error. It is not wrong. It just means something else. Now that something else is also related to conjunction, but not exactly conjunction. That means if you write a program, if you intend to use logical and, but you ended up mistakenly using a single ampersand, that means your program most of the time will do the right thing and occasionally will do the wrong thing. It's one of, that's the worst problem you can have. If it is just syntactically wrong, it is actually good because the compiler will catch it right away. You just go, oh, okay, I really meant to be you know, to, meant to use double ampersand. But if it is right in terms of syntax, it just do something that's different that is actually similar to the or to the intended operator. That's one of the worst problems you can have, and you will find a lot of stuff like that in C and C plus plus. You know, single equal symbol and double equal symbol, single ampersand, and double ampersand. And guess what? There's another one that some of you will have to watch out for. Exclamation, exclamation point followed by equal symbol is not equal to. There's another operator, which is a vertical bar followed by an equal symbol. And it means something that is completely different. Mm, awesome. This is, this is a self-assigning bitwise OR operator. <laughs> okay, which I won't explain in this class, but it definitely means something that is completely different from this one. Okay, so that's why in C and C++ programming, you really have to watch out for stuff like this. Okay, you know, something that looks very similar, but means something that is completely different. Okay, because somebody's going to get bitten by this, I guarantee it. <laughs> <coughs> I believe somebody wrote a book, you know, um, that tells people how to write programs in C, and they describe C as a language that leaves a rope long enough to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> That's how they describe the C programming language. And we haven't even talked about pointers and the other really nasty stuff in C, which also makes C <coughs> a very good programming language. Yeah, so it's good and bad. It's a very powerful tool. Imagine C as a really good power tool, but without any safety measures. <laughs> so you might lose a finger while you're programming. Yeah, Pascal is more like a hand tool <laughs> with all kinds of safety features. Yeah, you can kind of score yourself or scratch yourself, but for the most part, you won't even bleed. C is like a super power tool, you know, like a you know circular saw with no guard whatsoever. You just have the spinning blade, but it spins really fast. I mean, it cuts really well. You know, it will make a clean cut of just about anything. <coughs> <laughs> You just have to use it right. <laughs> and assembly programming is even worse. Okay. Yeah, it's like it's not even a circular saw, it's more like an industrial laser. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> with no safety measure, with no safety mechanism. Just point it that way and it will it will just shoot, you know, it will just you know, melt whatever is you know in that way. You can slice, you can poke holes, you know, just make sure you don't point it to yourself. <laughs> Or have mirrors in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I forgot one thing. I got digressed. Okay. So this is the four things you can do with conjunction, because with a conjunction, the two sides of a conjunction, each side has to be something that it, that can either be true or false. Okay. It doesn't make any sense to say 
what is four or f uh, four and five? That doesn't make any sense. In this case, you know, each side can only be true or false. So we end up with only four possible combinations. True and true is true. That is the only case you can get a conjunction to be true. For all the other cases, when at least one side is false, the whole thing is false. Is that consistent with the normal use of the word and in English? Yeah. yeah. So there's no surprises here. The next one is to call the disjunction, which is a fancy word for or. Okay? And this one also has two sides. The, the operator has two sides to it. The entire disjunction, the entire expression is true if and only if at least one side is true. In other words, you can have one side being true, the other side being true, or both sides being true. The whole thing is still true. So if you look at the truth table, true or true is true. False or true is true because at least one side is true. True or false is true because, once again, at least <coughs> one side is true. The only time you can get this junction to be false is to have all components to be false. Yes? Is it possible to, uh, <coughs> for the previous one, for the end, to have uh, true, false, true, like compare three things instead of just two? No. Or this In programming, all operators like these only have two sides, only the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Now, just like with multiplication, you can say A and B and C. So you can write it out like that. Yep. In mathematics, uh, so the Gordon convention for the uh, for the and is actually the E and for the uh, distant disjunction would be an N. Is there a reason why the programming is like, you know, similar shapes? Well, this is the math symbol for OR, which is more like a V symbol. Okay. Um, but in programming, we use, you know, in, in C, we use double vertical bar to mean logical OR. And once again, a single vertical bar means something different. <laughs> so you got to make sure that you use the right operator, because it's very easy to use the wrong one. The compiler won't complain about it. It will do about the same thing, but it's not exactly the same. Yep. Back to the end part of that, if you are going to compare three things, you'd compare the first two items, then once the actual spits out, use that to compare the third? That is correct. It's the same as multiplication. In other words, if you want to use you know, three components, you can write you know, A and B and C. Okay? And just like with multiplication, you can put parentheses, artificial parentheses, around this one. You can also put it around B and C. They are the same. I think that's the, uh, is that the associative law in algebra? Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. <coughs> PHP, you can, you can chain multiple conditionals together. Is that not like, is that not valid? Is that like a loop? You can, so, is, could you say that again? Well, you could, you could have like A, if A is, if A, and then you could like three or four, you put as many as you want in there, and yeah. throw an error. And you can do the same thing in just about any programming language. Are you talking about you know using multiple ands and mul or multiple ors to string things together? Yeah, you could go and and or. And it was yeah. Still, well, okay. I can tell you right now. You know the conjunction is kind of like multiplication in arithmetics. The or is kind of like the addition of arithmetics. So you can combine these you know in any way you want. Okay. Now, in this class, we will try not to make our expressions or Boolean expressions, you know, basically anything that uses and, or, and not, too complicated. But in actual programming, you can find logic to be expressed in very complicated ways using and, or, and tons of parentheses. You know, it's, it's just like multiplication and addition and subtraction in um, arithmetic. Okay. Any questions about this slide? Moving on to the last one, which is also the easiest one, negation, which is the fancy word of not in English. This operator only has one single side, which is on the right-hand side. The negation is true if and only if the value of the right-hand side is false. The mathematical symbol is kind of like a cliff. Okay? In C and other languages derived from C, the symbol to represent not is an exclamation point. Now you understand why exclamation point equals means not equal to, because exclamation point itself 
represents not okay negation. In other programming languages, it's simply spelled out as not in those other languages. Now this one is easy because we only have one side to worry about. Not true is false. Not false is true. That's about it. Are we doing okay so far with these operators? Are we doing okay with comparisons? What if I tell you that of all the comparisons, I really only need one? Then I can actually work out all the other ones. In other words, you can give me just less than, you give me and, or, and not, and I'll be able to work out all the other comparison operators. Does anyone buy that? Yeah. Kind of? Let's work this out. Okay, this is a good exercise to see whether we really have a good understanding of logical operators and comparison. So let's go ahead and work this out. Okay, so I'm going to describe the problem here. If I am given only one comparison operator less than itself, and all the logical operators, which consists of and, or, and not, how can I implement all the other uh, comparison operators? That's the question, okay? Well, first thing first, that's easy, because I am given the less than operator. So there's no problem with expressing x is less than y. What about x is greater than y? If I am, uh, if I am only given less than, how can I express x is greater than y? It's an easy one. Uh, not. No, 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 no. Not does not do it. No. You can flip the two sides, OK? So when I use this, it means equivalent to, okay? So x is greater than y is equivalent to y is less than x. So I just solved the problem. Because remember, I'm only given with the less than operator. The right-hand side of the equal equal only uses the less than operator. I'm good to go. Um, let's try something a little bit more evil like this. x is less than or equal to y, and I'm only given the less than symbol, and all the logical operators. How can I express that x is less than or equal to y when I can only use less than? y is not less than x. y is not less than x. Very good. So it is not the case that y is less than x. It means exactly the same thing. Does that make sense? OK. <clears throat> So the same for the same reason, if I have x is greater than or equal to y, it is the same as saying it is not the case that x itself is less than y. It's symmetric, right? Kind of? Okay. What about this one? Uh, well, I'm trying, to de <coughs> I'm trying to decide whether I should go for the equal first or the not equal first. Let's go for the not equal first. Not equal first is the easy one. What if I say x is not, does not equal to y? We talked about this one already. Remember earlier how I explained why in some programming languages not equal to is represented by less than greater than? So how do I say it you know, with only using the less than operator? How about something like this? x is less than y or y is less than x. Does that mean the same thing as x does not equal to y? I think so. OK, cool. And the last one is easy. If we already can get to this point, how do we say x equals y? Well, x equals y means x is not different from y. But we already know how to say x is different from y. You have to use the, you basically get to, get to use the same thing you did on the previous line, except to use and. Well, we can do something like this, right? <laughs> or we can do something like this. We can say it is not the case, okay, I have to use parentheses in this case. It is not the case that x is less than y, and it is not the case that y is less than x. It means exactly the same thing, right? Because if x is not less than y and y is not less than x, they must be the same. 
So this is really cool because all I need is one single comparison operator. If you give me all the other logical operators, I can work it out. Okay. Now let's take a look at this one. If I am only given um, negation and conjunction, how can I express uh, this junction. Okay. In other words, um, I want to express A or B, but I can only express that as negation and conjunction. I can only use not and and. How can I do it? <laughs> Does anyone want to? How about this? I will put this up as a brain teaser. Okay, I will tell you guys you know, what the solution is on Wednesday. It's not your homework. You don't have to do it. There's nothing to turn in. But I'll just you know, put this up as a brain teaser. Okay, if I, only, if I am only given with not and, and conjunction and negation, how can I express disjunction? Okay, it's a good a brain teaser. Mm, no. <laughs> we'll talk about it on uh, on Wednesday. This, I mean, uh, this is it's not. I mean, Thursday. It's not trivial, okay? But you can look it up. You know, that's perfectly fine. It's not a homework assignment. Um, but spending some time to think about it will help you really understand the operators. Okay. We're not done yet. We still have five minutes. All right, so back to the example. This is what we can do, because now we have the tools to express that y, w is greater than or equal to x and w is greater than or equal to y. Because when w is greater than or equal to x is true and w is greater than or equal to y is true, what does that mean? w is one of the maximums. It may not be the only one, but it is definitely the maximum of the three. Does that make sense? So in that case, if this is true, if the conjunction is true, then I have no worry. W has to be the maximum. I can update Z to become the maximum. What if this is false? Well, if that is false, that means W is not the maximum. If W is, is, is not the maximum, maybe X is. So that's why I can test whether X is the maximum or not. X is greater than or equal to W, and X is greater than or equal to Y. If that conjunction is true, then we just confirm that X is the maximum. Now, I know some of you will say, but we don't really need something this complicated to confirm that x is the maximum now that we know w is not the maximum. Well, yes, that is true, but this is OK, too. This is not wrong. It is just you know, maybe a little bit less efficient than it has to be. Yep. Wouldn't on um, line one you need to be put in a condition that x is not equal to y? Because less than or equal to a less than or equal to if x and y are equal, then w is equal to x and y. Say again? <laughs> on line one, yes. if, if x were equal to y, the way yes. it's written, then w would not be greater than x or y, and therefore it would not be. It so can still be. You mean, you mean when x equals y, yeah. then this expression has to be false? Yeah, well, it's not greater than. Well, I mean, you wouldn't like default to w. You know, it, and then do is since they're all equal, then why not just use number? Well, then what I want to do is to find the maximum of the three. So if they're all equal, then. If they're all equal, a no problem. They're all the maximum. Okay, that's a good question. You know, because this particular algorithm does catch all the possible cases, where only one of the three is the maximum, two of the three is the maximum, all the maximums, or all three are the same, which means they're all both the maximum and the minimum. You know, this algorithm will work for all of those cases. Okay. All right. And the following. Yep. Go ahead. The follow-up one is: Would that uh, would the aspect, would the answer be an error because all three are maximum and minimums? But they can be. I mean, by definition, maximum means you know, it is possible for all three variables to be all maximums if they have the same value. But they all they all become the minimum as well because they're all the the minimum. Okay. In other words, okay. Let me give you a you know, analogy. You walk into a room, you have you know, three people, okay? three people in the room. 
if they are all of the same height, don't you think they are all the tall? The, 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 they are all tallest in the room. If they are, if they are of the same height. If I ask you, in if I walk into the same room, if I walk into the room, we have three people of exactly the same height, and I say, okay, who, which one of you is the tallest? Okay, any one of them can can raise their hand and say, I'm the tallest. If I switch the question around and ask, you know, which one, which one of you is the shortest? Then any one of them can say, I'm the shortest too, because they are of the same height. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was thinking like whether the high is 35, the low is 35, that doesn't, doesn't make sense, it's, it's 35 degrees. Yeah, I know it's funny when they are the same, when they're, when they're all the same, but by definition, maximum still exists when all the values are identical. So when, that, uh, when you input the numbers, when you make that program, the end result will show an error, it will give you an answer. It will give you an answer, yep, that is correct. Okay. So the following is basically a trace. You know, if I make x, y, and z all the same, this is what it will. What, this is what it will do. Now the next one is you know explaining you know what do we do when we have else if because we we have not really talked about else if here. So what it is is yeah, let's go back here. Look at this one here. You still have to evaluate this from top to bottom. Okay, so remember, rule one is you always evaluate an algorithm or a construct from top to bottom. That's rule number one. That means you always evaluate the condition of line one before you think of anything else. If the condition of line one is true, you always have to execute line two, and then you get out of the whole thing. All right? Only if the condition of line one is false, then you go to line three and see if the condition of line three is true or not. If in that case, if the condition of line three is true, you execute line four and you get out of the whole thing. You get to line six if and only if all the conditions before that are false. Okay. So remember what I just said and I'll point you to the picture that represents exactly the same thing and that will be the end of today's lecture. Okay. This is the picture. You come in from the top, you evaluate the condition, okay, I can show you this part here. You come in from the top, you evaluate the condition of the first line. It can go one way or the other. If it is true, you execute line two in this case. If it is false, you go to line three, and then you evaluate another condition. If you do go to line two, and you're done with line two, you can see that this path goes all the way out of the entire conditional statement. If you do go to line three, which is another conditional statement, you have you can go to line this. I think this is line four, and this is line six. If you go to line four and you're done with it, you get out of the whole thing. You go to line six, you're done with it. You also go out, get out of the entire thing. So try to associate the code that you saw in the previous slide with this picture. Your reading assignment. We are done today. The reading assignment is definitely all the way up to conditional statements because we have already covered pretty much the entire thing of conditional statements. And we'll start on loops on Thursday. Okay? I'll see you guys on Thursday. And hopefully parking will be a little bit better on that day. And our wage will be next week, actually. Sorry? Our wage next week, actually. Okay.